Hello, I'm Bernard Hickey from Interest.co.nz and welcome to our special monthly report on the Chinese economy and emerging Asia. And we've got an expert here, Peter Redwood from Redwood & Associates. Welcome back, Peter. Thank you. Always keen to see what's happening in China to start with yes. and we've seen some interesting import and export figures over the last week or so. What's happening in that global powerhouse? Yes, we saw quite a significant drop in, uh, in imports in particular. Exports were only down half a percent year on year in January, but imports were, were down about 16%. Uh, and the trade surplus surged. So there, there is a little cause for concern there, um, although it's very difficult to tell what's going on with January and February numbers in China because of the Lunar New Year festivities. And what you find is that um, they, they obviously bounce between January and February and depending on which year it is, uh, it can have quite dramatic effects. And obviously the year of the dragon is going to have the biggest effect of the lot. So what does it say about how strong the Chinese economy is, those factories, consumption, imports? I mean, the rest of the world who might be trying to sell into China, what, what, is, what are we seeing behind the veil? We've basically ignored the trade numbers. Now, I know at face value that sounds kind of strange. Uh, but the rationale that we have is because of the seasonality issues, we can't distinguish what's really going on by looking at the hard numbers. So what we've got to look at is, is partial indicators. And in our opinion, the best indicators to monitor are things like credit spreads, uh, exchange rates, uh, interest rates, and also, and most importantly, commodity prices. Uh, and what we're seeing in the commodities market is actually that uh, while October, November and December were pretty bad for most commodities, uh, we've seen a fairly significant rally since mid-December across the board. Now that's certainly not consistent with what you would expect if there was a hard landing emerging in China. Demand for commodities like copper, zinc, even though zinc has uh, a very large glut right now, it's prices holding up, um, uh, coal, iron ore, those sorts of products are holding in reasonably well. So if we, there was a hard landing in China, what would that look like to the rest of the world? Uh, to the rest of the world, I think it would look pretty bad uh, because what we would see is, is a very substantial fall in the price of industrial metals in particular. So the, 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 the products that go into the furnace of Chinese production would essentially drop away. From a Chinese growth perspective, the numbers may actually still print quite well. And this is one of the uh, things that a lot of people struggle with because a hard landing for China can still be consistent with growth of 6 to 7 per cent per annum. What you would get is, if you look at the breakdown of growth, uh, private consumption expenditure may drop from around 3 percentage points co contribution at the moment to, to perhaps, say, 2. Um, but you're still going to get positive growth in consumption coming from urbanisation and rising real wages and government transfers. Government is going to continue to spend, contributing maybe 2, 2.5 percentage points to growth, potentially more if there's a fiscal stimulus. So uh, where you get the drop in domestic demand comes from private investment, and that could fall substantially. But if we saw a substantial fall in private investment, particularly in construction, what we would see is a dropping away of imports of raw materials, capital goods, intermediate goods. Um, and that's kind of why people were a little worried about the trade numbers in January, because we did see some signs of that. But you would also see a fairly substantial fall in commodity prices accompanying that, and that we didn't see. So the overall GDP number could actually hold up quite well, driven by a jump in the trade surplus and a, an improvement in net exports. Does that mean then that the Chinese don't need to ease their monetary or their fiscal policy? Uh, our view is that they do need to ease uh, their monetary policy, not their fiscal policy. Their fiscal policy needs to maintain um, on a long-term sustainable path. And we would, uh, uh, given the demographic problems that China faces and the potential off-balance sheet liabilities that could crystallise in their direction, we think that it's prudent for the central government to remain cautious on fiscal policy. On monetary policy, we've seen somewhat of an expansion of monetary policy and easing of interbank liquidity. Um, although there's a lot of debate about whether there needs to be another cut in required reserve ratios for banks. Um, we're not expecting a, a lowering of the lending and deposit rates, um, nor are we expecting a significant shift in renminbi strategy. So uh, as Premier Wen describes it, this is a fine-tuning policy. They're attempting to engineer a soft landing, which in uh, a market economy is usually a, fa a failed attempt. Uh, in a planned economy, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Now on this issue of uh, lending to local governments, there's been some news this week that a lot of those loans made through 2008-2009 are now being rolled over. 
Could this be a problem for the Chinese economy or is it just business as usual in China? Well, this is an issue we spoke about last time and uh, it's definitely still on the agenda. Um, the size of uh, uh, local government financing vehicle debt is very substantial, upwards of 30% of, of GDP. Um, in our opinion, in the, in the here and now, right at this point, it probably isn't a problem because those loans can be rolled over. Um, and the banking system can absorb it. Most of, a lot of those loans were actually structured as bullet loans, so there's no interest or, or uh, capital repayment due until the loan expires. Brilliant, just the um, sort of loan you need. Well, these loans work well in a small uh, developing economy when mm. you've got very rapid economic growth because the size of balance sheets grows fast enough that, that you can absorb potential losses and, and you can push these problems out. And in China, that's still, even though China's massive, that's still basically the case. Now, that won't remain the case in the next decade as China matures and starts slowing down. So at some point in time, uh, this issue of rollover of loans and bad debts and impairments is going to become a, a, a major problem. It will crystallise on the banking system. Now, just looking at the renminbi, which until now, the last couple of years, has been a relatively lightly traded, yes. given the amount of trade that goes on with China. But in recent months, we've seen an improvement. Can you talk about what's going on there? Yeah, that's a very interesting story. Um, most uh, people have been talking about RMB internationalization as, as a key event for our time. And, and yet when you look at the turnover data and, and, and what's actually happening on the ground, it's been incredibly disappointing for most people. Uh, in the last 12 months, that picture has begun to change. So uh, SAFE uh, announced that uh, turnover in Remimbi totaled 14.2 uh, trillion US dollars last year. That equates to around just under 60 billion dollars of daily turnover. Uh, now that would make uh, China's share of global FX transactions around just under 4% up from less than 1% the year earlier. So oh, that's, that's a very sizable, growth, sizable yeah. jump. Yeah. Uh, and if it continues to grow at this rate, then possibly by t the end of this year, turnover in, in Remimbi will be similar to, the, to what we would see in, say, Aussie or Swiss franc or, or, or Canadian dollar. Not up to the level of the euro or sterling or yen, but climbing. Eventually, though, reserve currency or not? That seems to be the debate, but we seem a long way from there. I think we are. Um, I, I was discussing this earlier in, in, in my commentary. The uh, people continue to talk about the reduction in the current account surplus as uh, suggesting that the Remimbi's appreciation pressure might dissipate. Uh, what they're forgetting, though, is that foreign ownership of Chinese domestic assets is extremely low. Mm -hmm. Uh, ownership of stocks is relatively low, ownership of bonds is essentially non-existent, ownership of property is non-existent, uh, and, and central banks hold almost none of their reserves in Remimbi. Now, if we move down the path of internationalisation and reserve currency status, all of that has to change, in which case, while the current account surplus might shrink, we're going to see a big increase in capital inflows into China, replacing that and ongoing upward pressure on the value of the Remimbi for many years to come. Meanwhile, though, there still seems to be plenty of capital flows out of China into the euro and talk that China might help Europe solve its crisis. What's going on there? Yes, yeah, so this is a, a case of looking at the very short term versus the bigger picture. And certainly in the very short term, what we've seen is while most currencies have appreciated pretty significantly this year against the dollar, the Remimbi is one exception. Uh, and that's very clearly been controlled. And so we've seen the People's Bank coming in and, and defending around that 6.30 level to the US dollar, buying dollars. Uh, and in our opinion, a good portion of those dollars have been recirculated back into European assets. So that's Chinese money printing effectively to try and keep their currency down? Uh, to an extent. Uh, and to the extent that we've seen uh, them intervening in foreign exchange markets, some of that liquidity would have gone into the domestic banking system and probably acted to keep the repo rate around the 3.7% level right now. Um, and without that, the pressure on the central bank to cut the triple R would have been even bigger. So arguably, all we've seen is foreign inflows replacing the need for um, liquidity injection from the central bank. Excellent. Peter Redwood there from Redwood and Associates with our monthly report on China and emerging Asia. I'm Bernard Hickey for interest.co.nz.